And let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we just invite your presence again as we open your word, as we look at the statements in the spirit of prophecy uh, that relate to the time that we are living in. And we ask, Lord, that you can give us wisdom and insight, that your Holy Spirit can comfort us as we contemplate uh, the events that are unfolding before us and our place and responsibility in sharing those things with others and in developing a Christ-like character. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so... Uh, we're back to this uh, booklet, The Crisis Ahead, by Robert W. Olson. And uh, this question here, should our people constantly be constantly reminded that persecution is coming and large numbers will apostatize? And we have this statement from First Selected Messages, page 180, and Second Selected Messages, page 13. There is a time of trouble coming to the people of God, but we are not to keep that constantly before the people and rein them up to have a time of trouble beforehand. Uh, there is to be a shaking among God's people, but this is not the present truth to carry to the churches. Now, of course, we don't have the whole context of that statement. But based on this statement, so we're just jumping into it here, what would Ellen White mean by that? What, what does she mean by this statement? especially this part, you know, uh, that we have a time of trouble beforehand. I mean, obviously, it's important to know about these things. You know, we know there's going to be a shaking among God's people. It's in early writings and, and so forth. We know about the time of trouble. I would take from it that she's saying that don't bring that time of trouble. Be distressed about it before the time. Okay, yeah, so so we're not going to be distressed about it. Okay, then what about uh, the, the way that I would look at it? So this is my perspective. We, we, uh, we have a lot of people who, who focus constantly, they keep things in a fever pitch regarding end time events, right? There's every news headline, every um, everything that happens, it's constantly, you know, the sky is falling, right, sort of thing. And um, we, we need to be, recognize that there is a time coming. And, of course, we're in a time uh, that's much closer than in Ellen White's day. But our focus can't be just upon the coming calamity, right? Will, will that prepare us? If we constantly tell people about what's going to happen, is that enough to prepare us for what's going to happen, I guess, is the question. And, and this, it is sort of a rhetorical question, but I do expect a response. Well, I think we should take the whole package. That's one dimension. Yeah. To be okay. mindful of. But there's so much more other things that we need to uh, consider as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I do know some people that their message is always about what's coming. But we know that we we... We need to understand the past in order to understand the future, right? And the present even, uh, you know, and in some ways the present is the key to the past, like they're all connected, right? So as we go through fulfilled prophecy, we, we can see things happening in the past. We understand their significance. They give us insight to what's happening in the future. So, so I would think that she's talking in a, a very particular context. I'm trying to find... Uh, the statement here, here it is. And that's the one thing I dislike about statements that are out, out, out of context is, well, I'm going to read a little bit here from this section. Okay. Is this, is this from Selected Messages? Yeah, page 180. Okay. Uh, 79, actually, I'm starting not. At, Select, yeah. Your source document? Manuscript, uh, the source document for this would be Manuscript 82 of 1894. Okay. Yeah, that, just, that's paragraph 28. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so uh, here we have, um, she says, there is a time of trouble coming to the people of God, but we are not to keep it constantly before the people and rein them up to have a time of trouble beforehand. Right. So we had read that part. There is to be a shaking among God's people, uh, but this is not 
the present truth to carry to the churches. The ministers should not feel that they have some wonderful advanced ideas, and unless they, unless all receive these, they will be shaken out, and people will arise to go forward and upward to the victory. Some of those who are resisting the very principles of the message of God, the, the message God has sent for this time, present just such cases as yourself. They point to the extreme views and teachings as an excuse for their neglect of receiving the Lord's messages. So, yes, yeah, so there's lots of context here. No. Uh, okay, so you're, okay, do I, do you want? If we, one of the points where the ellipse is placed here from selected messages, if we read this as you're asking in context, there it's is. May 19th, 1890. There, okay, okay, is that the one? No. No, because that's... You have, you have letter 15A of 1890 is one, but the one that fits better is manuscript 82 of 1894. Okay, so manuscript. Okay, let's take on I can't bring it up. Okay. I will read, I'll read this portion again for us to consider. There is a time of trouble coming to the people of God. But we are not to keep that constantly before the people and rein them up to have a time of trouble before him. There is to be a shaking among God's people. But this is not the present truth to carry to the churches. It will be the result of refusing the truth presented. So the shaking is the result of refusing truth. Yeah. The ministers should not feel that they have some wonderful advanced ideas. And unless all receive these, they will be shaken out. And a people will arise to go forward and upward to victory. Satan's object is accomplished just as surely when men run ahead of Christ and do the work that he has never entrusted to their hands. And when they remain in the Laodicean state, lukewarm, feeling rich and increased with goods, and in need of nothing, the two classes are equally stumbling blocks. Okay, so this is which manuscript? Manuscript 82, 1894. We've just read paragraphs 28 and 29. Okay, so so the other one is is from earlier. That's from 1890. Correct. Okay. To what is it? Charles Jones, C. A. Jones. The other one. The, Letter 15A. Yeah. Okay, so I'm looking at manuscript 82, 1894. You said. That is correct. Yes. Yes. Okay, and that's to who? You were asking about letter 15A. No, that's not to Jones. Uh, no, I wasn't asking about letter 15A. I was asking about the first selected messages, page 180. That okay. is initially uh, Brother K. Okay, that must be Brother Jones. May 19th, 1890? Uh, I believe that's correct. Okay, so yeah, it here just has a K, so it must be Brother Jones, I guess. Um, they just put alphabetically in order, just different letters for different people. Okay. So so she wrote something two years later that she's just going to use, she's going to quote from in this other manuscript. She's four years use, later. Yeah. Four, four years later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here's where I wanted to read. It says, um, you will take passages in the testimonies that speak of the close of probation, of the shaking among God's people, and you will talk of a coming out from this people of a pure, holier people that will arise. Now, all this pleases the enemy. We should not needlessly take a course that will make differences or create dissension. We should not give the impression that if our particular ideas are not followed, it is because the ministers are lacking in comprehension and in faith and are walking in darkness. Your mind has been on an unnatural strain for a long time. You have much truth, precious truth, but mingled with suppositions. Your extreme ideas and strong language often destroy the effect of your best efforts. Should many accept the views you advance and talk and act upon them, 
uh, they will see one of the greatest fanatical excitements that has ever been witnessed among Seventh-day Adventists. This is what Satan wants. Now, so we know when we take this type of counsel here in the spirit of prophecy, that, that often what people do is they will take these statements and uh, place them into a context of their own choosing, right? Right. And, and, and that can be true of the statements that he talks about the close of probation, or, or it can be true of statements like this, where she ta- warns about talking about the close of probation, that we need to understand the principles involved. We need to understand the characters involved. Really, we need to understand our own heart, whether these things apply to us in a certain situation or not. So how to apply, you know, the proper use of the testimonies. A.T. Jones wrote a really good, uh, they did a sermon on it, and there's also an article on it. But one of the things about the testimonies that I, that I find that Satan has, has used is people using the testimonies as, as a way as, as we sort of weaponize them against our opponents, right? People we don't like, people you know, that we're in competition with or whatever, uh, you know, instead of applying these things to ourselves, instead of using this counsel for self-examination. Now, a, a question here. What, what's the difference from the testimonies, like the testimonies to the church, and, and other things that Ellen White has written? So let's, if we look at her visions in particular, especially the early ones, um, and then we look at things like the great controversy vision and, and the revelation that has happened from that, which produced the conflict of the ages series. And then we have, you know, the testimonies. And then she has particular counsel to different individuals or to the church or different types of books like education. You know, so if we take the testimonies, uh, is there a difference in let's say, reading the great controversy or reading the testimonies. Let's put it that way, just sort of in simple terms like that, in a way that we look at it or use that material. I don't know. Well, if one, know. Well, wouldn't one be for the, the testimonies to the church? Okay, so the testimonies to the church, what are they particularly? What is it about the testimonies to the church? What is their purpose? To edify the church, to to. Correct the church, right? Yeah, correct the church, yeah. So she's writing testimonies or counsels, often to in individuals, but they were compiled together because God gave her specific information regarding a situation, right? Mm-hmm. So God showed her in vision somebody's condition or in a dream somebody's condition. And, and so she wrote counsel to them. And and then she she takes those counsels that were to an individual, and she now uh, publishes them because they can be a benefit for others who may be in that same situation. Now, one of the things I found in studying the testimonies is that, um, and, and I remember this specifically, it's actually testimonies to ministers. Uh, there is counsel in there where Ellen White is talking about not controlling uh, people in their personal decisions, like where they should go and what they should do, what work they should be involved in, that the church isn't to control uh, the individual in their personal decisions, right? Even as they relate to the church, like the type of work they're supposed to do, whether they're called to go somewhere or not, that that's up to the individual. But then she writes to the individuals and say that we are not to be rebellious and that we need to heed the counsel of, of, of the leadership and people above us in, 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 in guiding us in what we are to do. Are, are those contradictory statements? Are, are they compatible with each other? The idea that we shouldn't, we shouldn't control others and the idea that we shouldn't rebel against the control of others. I guess we could put it that way. I think it's a balance in between. It's a balance. Okay. Now, so who is it to decide uh, who those that counsel applies to? So here's what a person will do. You're in leadership, right? And, you know, you have someone under you, 
and you bring up the statements about this about not rebelling against leadership, right? That that's the counsel you're going to look at, and you're going to apply that counsel to this other person. You're going to say you need to listen to this counsel from the testimonies, and then uh, the other person, you know, who's who's been given that counsel, he's going to look at the other statement and says. You shouldn't be, you know, telling people what to do. You need to heed that counsel. Are, are those people using the testimonies correctly? They are not. They should be applying them to themselves in their particular right. situation. It's not to so, be used for, to sort of uh, rebuke someone as for their own. Uh, right. Kinds of- yeah. So we need to use the, the testimonies as a means of self-examination. That is, sometimes, you know, there's a testimony that somebody thinks applies to me, but I don't think applies to me at all, right? And and it's up to me to decide whether it applies to me. I can't use the testimonies to judge and condemn others, other people. Right? That, that's not the purpose of the testimonies. The purpose is for me to examine myself. Is there something in that testimony that speaks to my heart and tells and corrects me? I should be looking for correction of myself, not for correcting other people. Right. So as Stephen has, has basically said. And um, so, so I bring that up in the context here of of these types of statements. That people will take a statement like this that's applied to a particular situation. And then they will try to use it against us. They'll say, here is what you are doing. Are they using that testimony correctly? We have to say no, right? That we as individuals read these testimonies and we have to decide, does this apply to my situation? Is this a counsel that I need to heed? Because we also have counsel that we need to bring to people um, you know, the seriousness of the time that we're in. Ellen White herself does it. So here there is a context in which this person is is unbalanced, right? You know, it's not my favorite word in the world, but, you know, they they see some things and they're they're making it basically almost as a test, whatever this issue is that they think is important, that this is the issue that if you don't heed me, you know, you're going to go into apostasy, you're going to be lost. And that is a great danger. Now, we do believe there are things that are really important, right, that that we have studied. But first, we need to obey those things, right, that God has shown us, to understand them, to share them with others, but not to present them in this do or die situation all of the time. Everything that we study, everything that we learn now is not the present truth that has to be uh, shared and has to be accepted by, by everybody that we talk to. Correct? Am, am I off balance here? Does that make sense to people? Even these things that we consider quite important are not necessarily the message that has to be brought to every person. They're not a test to every person. But to every person, when they come in contact with truth, is it a test to them? That is, is truth always a test? So, so Kelly says in you know, a principle is mutual respect and submission. That's true. Dealing with these, these, uh, the opposing counsels regarding control and rebellion. And then Angela puts plus, as long as we know others are following God consistently or learning from the lessons God's trying to teach them or us and generally care for us we can consider and likely find their counsel worth following, especially if it accords with the gods, with what God's intimating to us, right? So, so one is we do have respect for other people, which is, is, is weighted based upon our experience with a person, right? There are some people I would, I would heed their counsel much more readily or consider their counsel much more readily than other individuals, right? So there are some people I respect more than others. It's just the reality because of my experience with them. But I, I think one thing is also allowing people the freedom to make decisions on their own is, is pretty important. 
Uh, why is it important to allow people to make their own decisions? You don't want to coerce, that's for sure. Okay. Well, let's say I force somebody or manipulate somebody into make a decision. Who's responsible for for the outcome? If it doesn't turn out, who's to blame? That'll be both. A little bit of both. <laughs> yeah. Well, that person's <laughs> blame me, right? I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. so when when we make our own decisions and when we allow people to make their own decisions, then they they are more inclined to take the responsibility for the outcome of their decision. At least they they should. Sometimes people just blame everything on someone else, no matter who made the decision. But but definitely, if you make a decision for another person, uh, you're relieving them of the responsibility of the consequences of that decision, right? They can readily blame you, right? Even though, I mean, they did listen to you and, and they're to blame for that. But but you understand what I'm saying, that, that it gives them an easy out from the concept. And so some people always seek to have other people make their decisions for them so that they don't have to bear responsibility for the consequences, right? So, I mean, here we've just dealt with basically this one statement in the spirit of prophecy so far. But, um, uh, you know, one of the things we can say about, uh, where's, where's this document here? I lost it. Uh, that going to work? Yes, okay. That didn't work. Staying on. Okay. So, so a lot of things there to discuss. Now, um, verse thir or point thirteen. When the majority of our members withdraw, will seventh will the Seventh Day Adventist Church collapse? Now, we had some discussion about this last night, and this obviously is a controversial uh, topic. And some of these statements we're pretty familiar with. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion were being sifted out. The chaff separated from the precious wheat. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless, it must take place. So how is this generally interpreted in the church? Well, they say the church being the uh, corporate, corporate. Yeah, the institution. Corp institution, yeah. So, so the institution of the church, that is the denominational corporation the organization is not going to fall that's that's the way it's interpreted um now other people interpret it i interpret it this way that that this means when it appears about to fall this is because the organizational church structure is going to fall but it doesn't but the church does not fall because when the organizational structure falls apart the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. That is, many people who are attached to the church because of what it gains by being attached to the church, jobs and, and social situations and so forth, when those are removed, they will go with it like rats from a sinking ship, right? Um, but the true will remain, right? We, we will stay with the truth. That's the way that I've always understood this statement. But, but there is, it's, it's obviously a controversial statement. Okay. Now, Kelly wrote a comment, uh, says, Theodore, I like how you put it concerning God's will for each individual. It's usually something we don't want to do. God doesn't interrupt us, uh, when we are doing his will. Though I find he does give confirmation when doing his will eventually after a time of trust. Yeah, so yeah, I think that's a good point. Okay, so anyway, going back to here, the church is the depository of the wealth of the riches of the grace of Christ, and through the church eventually will be made manifest the final and full display of the love of God to the world that is to be lightened with its glory. Now, in this statement, we it, it, it's all on how you define the church. It's not the Seventh-day Adventist church organization that is the depository of the wealth and riches of the grace of Christ. Or is it? Well, if, it you're says, talking about, well, if you're talking about silver and gold and money. Well, yeah, but this isn't yeah. talking. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, I know, it's talk, I know it's not talking about that. But 
I mean, it, it, and that, that depository of wealth and riches of the grace of Christ would be manifest in the life of the individuals within the church. Definitely the church structure can't be a depository of such a thing, right? right? Because then it could be removed, right? I mean, if you got rid of the church structure, then, well, you know, that depository of wealth and riches of the grace of Christ would be gone. So, so we have to say that this is the work that when we talk about the church, it's the body of Christ. It's those that are connected with Christ, this living body that, uh, that works, that, that Christ works through to reach those who are in darkness. So this, this emphasis upon the church institution, I don't find in the spirit of prophecy when she talks about the church. There's times she talks about the Seventh-day Adventist Church as an organization, which she's talking about in practical terms of its institutions, its, its medical work and its schools and, and the churches itself and the, and the structure of the church, because those things exist. And she gives counsel in that regard. But when she talks about the church in this manner, I believe that she's talking about that church as the body of Christ, not as the institution. The ball works of Satan will never triumph. Victory will attend the third angel's message. As the captain of the Lord, Lord's host tore down the walls of Jericho, so will the Lord's commandment keeping people triumph and all opposing elements be defeated. And so to me, the church is people, right? Yes. And, 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 and I, I, you know, I don't understand how the church, I mean, I do understand I mean, I understand why institutions take the stand they do, right? It, it, it's, it's, it's the nature of an institution to believe that the institution is important. But, but we know that uh, an institution can't exist without people. You, you can have an institution, but if nobody's a member, it doesn't really matter, right? So, so churches are made up of people, but, but this sort of, I would call it a manipulation that somehow you have to just do everything that the church tells you to do. If you want to be a member in good and regular standing, um, you know, you have to pay your tithe to the church. You have to uh, not teach anything that the church tells you you can't teach. It, I don't see that in, in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. That will... sounds like the way I was treated. Catholic school, and this is what I despise about what's happening in the church, among many other things. Yeah. I mean, when I look at the church that way, and just to be really blunt, I mean, I think that's cult-like behavior. Catholicism. Well, I was I was having a discussion, or I was maybe it wasn't as much of a discussion with Iran before the study started this morning. But I've been studying lots about uh, psychology in, in trying to understand human behavior. Not, not, not pop psychology stuff, but, but actual uh, studies of, of scientific studies of, of how people behave. And, and one interesting uh, aspect had to do with groups and how uh, people attach to, to groups um, as, and, and there's an importance of groups. Obviously, we are social creatures, right? We, we, we interact with others and we learn how to behave sort of around others, and we identify with groups of people. You know, group identity is, is part of what exists as a part of our nature. But what, what we see happening, what we see is that, uh, you know, our, our, primary, our primary relationship needs to be with Christ. Christ is the one that we are connected to. And through Christ, we can be connected with others. Now, some try to create connections that are just just human connections, social connections. And so. So this this problem that we have. Is one where if, if I don't if I don't have my identity built in Christ, if I if I'm not founded in Christ and I'm founded in a church or a system of belief, I can easily be swayed in directions that that really, you know, are not from God, right? I'm not expressing myself well. But, but you understand that we can be pressured. We, we've talked about this before in, in the context of, 
you know, like transgenderism, where people people will claim to to support transgender uh, agenda because they or, have to, or, right? Because or a, political, this, or a political figure. Well, but but even you know, like I, you know, I know a person who works in a bank. You know, she's a bank manager, and um, she obviously doesn't agree with with all this stuff. But in order to keep her job, she does. But it's not even just her job. It's the social environment in which she is at work that even though probably, you know, everybody recognizes the emperor has no clothes, nobody's going to say anything about it, right? You know, to go to that old story, right? Because that would be to stand out. And you just don't know what the social consequences are, even when everyone else would agree with you. It's still going to have a social consequence, correct? Well, this is the dawn of totalitarianism. Maybe we're in the middle of it right now, <laughs> where a lot of people know that this woke stuff, this Marxist stuff is a total lie. But a lot of people are afraid of the social consequences if they speak up. Right. They could lose their jobs. Yeah. And I sympathize with them. But I mean, mm -hmm. as I told a professor... Who was a self-identifying socialist when I was when I was going going to the University of Winnipeg? I said my support for socialism ends where totalitarianism and tyranny begin. And you know, like he didn't flare up at me, but I had to say it, and I was nearly shouting at him. <laughs> yeah. So, but but we understand then that because we are social creatures. That if, that if our identity is in the group rather than in Christ, we are in danger, right? And that, that can happen in, in lots of different ways. People who are very conservative, who appear to be, you know, really uh, sticklers for the Bible and so forth, um, which really who have their identity within a group rather than in Christ individually. Because if we have our identity in Christ, aren't we able then to go from group to group with with surety and assurance and not be afraid of the social consequences? Um, Amen. I can't say I world. relish the back. Yeah, I don't relish the backlash, but with God's help, I'll keep enduring it. Yeah. You know, the, the other thing I've observed um, about individuals is that that people play roles, you know, you, you'll see people, you, you know, you go to the, the grocery store and you see a guy, he looks like a cowboy, right? Now, he might not even have a horse, but, you know, he's got the cowboy boots on, which you only really need if you ride a horse. There's a reason why you wear cowboy boots. Um, but, you know, he, he's from that group. He identifies with that group. And then you'll see a guy, you know, he kind of looks like, uh, you know, an 80s uh, rocker or something like that. You know, he dresses and he's got like, you know, the people dress in costumes to identify with groups, right? Some people wear a mask. Why do they wear a mask? They're, they're trying to identify themselves. This is a marker. It's a sign of, of the gang that they're in, right? You understand what I'm saying? And um, now, in some ways, we need to try to be as nondescript as possible. Right. That's why we don't we don't dress flamboyantly. You know, we don't dress in jewelry. It's it's our characters that need to shine out when in contact with others. And that as Christians, we should be able to to mingle with others. And, and to not be not to be tied down to to groups, to these social uh, constructs. Right. And, and we should be, feel comfortable to be whoever we are. We shouldn't have to play some role. You, you understand what I'm saying? I hope. Um, and, but if you if you t uh, tell somebody who's dressed as a cowboy or whatever that that's his gang, he might take offense. Like, I yeah, wouldn't well, do it. I would probably yeah, just address him as, hi, cowboy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all I'm saying is that people are trying to find an identity somewhere, right? That's why they dress a particular way. They, they, they want an identity. So that they they have they feel they have a place. 
it, you know, in some ways it's pretend, you know, it's like, you know, when I was a kid, we had these little, you know, these little, uh, uh, matchbox cars, right. You know, and, and as a kid, you know, they're very colorful and stuff like that. But as an adult, I shouldn't be driving a car, you know, that has flames on it. You know, if, if I'm an adult and I have a car that has flames on it, like the little toy car I had when I was a kid, I haven't grown up yet. Right. Your matchbox just got a little bigger. That's all. Yeah, right. But there are some people like that. They, 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 I knew one guy, he was the head elder of our church. And and he he dressed he drove cars from you know 1960 he dressed like he was from 1960 you know um, you know he, he he was playing that role as if he was still you know 20 years old or whatever he was in 1960 as if that was sort of he didn't want that time to change he didn't want to grow out of that and. Uh, you know, and, and, and we need to recognize that uh, one is we do get older, times change. So um, uh, uh, definitely not going to address, uh, obviously, like, like people do nowadays, but I'm going to address conservatively and non-descriptly as much as I can, right? I'm not going to try to play a role. I want to be, uh, you know, somebody who can reach all kinds of people. And my identity is in Christ. So that's an important uh, part here. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go on and read some more of this. Okay, how will this terrible ordeal affect the outlook and attitude of the loyal Adventists who remain in the church? Let opposition arise, let bigotry and intolerance again bear sway, let persecution be kindled, and the half-hearted and hypocritical will waver and yield the faith. But the true Christian will stand firm as a rock, his faith stronger, his hope brighter, in the, in the days of prosperity. So a true Christian has his anchor in Christ. He has faith and trust in Christ. It's something that has developed. And as opposition arises, his hope is brighter than the in days of prosperity. Right? And we and we can see that. Amidst the deepening shadows of earth's last great crisis, God's light will shine brightest. And the song of hope and trust will be heard in clearest and loftiest strains. And we can see that even in our life today, in the crises that we go through, that as we cling to Christ, Christ's character can be seen in us. Other people will, will see in, in, in things that happen to us, they see us uh, brave trials. And that gives them confidence that what we believe is the truth. When the story Form of persecution really breaks upon us. The true sheep will hear the true shepherd's voice. Self-denying efforts will be put forth to save the lost. And many who have strayed from the fold will come back to follow the great shepherd. Now, this is one that's always uh, held a special place for me ever since I read this statement. Anyway, the people of God will draw together and present to the enemy a united front in view of the common peril. Strife for supremacy will cease, and there will be no disputing as to who shall be accounted greatest. Then will the message of the third angel swell through a loud cry, and the whole earth will be lightened with the glory of the Lord. So one of the things that I could see here, so there's a number of thoughts. Now, why is there many who have strayed that will come back to follow the great shepherd? Haven't they gone out from us? Why, why is it that they're, they're coming back to follow the great shepherd? Why have they strayed, for one thing? Because these are particular many, types. Of yeah, go on. Many stray from disillusionment, from seeing the disorder, the corruption, the lack of um, hypocrisy and all those things. Yeah, hypocrisy, not, not being loyal to the truth kind of yeah. fake and 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 so, some have been and have been mistreated by the and, church yeah. yeah you know i've seen that happen people who have been mistreated by the church and and some of these you know cling to some degree to the truth right but it's obviously very difficult when you've been 
mistreated, when you've been pushed out, you've been treated roughly, and now you're out on the on your own, you have a faith in God. It's not going to necessarily grow. You're not going to be really strong uh, because maybe you're even, you know, just an Adventist for a short time. You didn't understand everything. But that's still there. Or you may have been somebody raised as an Adventist, but, you know, never found your place within the church because of how you were treated or how your parents were treated or whatever. But Ellen White says that these there will be self-denying efforts put forth to save the lost and that we will see people coming back. And Amen. that's that's a great hope for me. Now then, I'm, I'm, I'm a believer in the seeds of truth. You know, they can lay dormant in the dark for a long time sometimes. And, uh, mm-hmm. The Holy Spirit comes around long and waters them, but it, it's also like to be mentioned uh, seeing people go through trials and their faith shines brighter during that time. Yeah, because of the yeah. trials, it brings yeah. it out. Seeds can lay if they don't if they don't germinate. They can lay in a field for years and years and years until the rains of the Holy Spirit, you know, sprinkle upon them, right? And that can look like a trial, too. Yeah. Right? Does it, mm-hmm. yeah. Often. The people of God will draw together and present to the enemy united front. So that's an important point. This is, When we look at this, you know, in view of the common peril, strife for supremacy will cease, right? Now, obviously, to some degrees, we see people as, as our enemies. And obviously, as we have a true enemy, you know, we, we can press together. The sheep will press together, right? The, the wolf won't be able to get at the sheep because they're all pressing together. But often, you know, what, and one of the things that I saw in our movement, just my human judgment, was that, you know, we weren't ready in, on July 18th because of all this strife for supremacy, the, the things that were going on in the movement, that the movement was not united. Um, I, I just knew individually for sure that I wasn't ready. And, well, well, that too. So all I did was wait and watch. I yeah, just knew I, I wasn't definitely, ready. I didn't, I, I didn't I really think I, it was going to yeah. happen like it was predicted, but yeah. wait and watch. Yeah, yeah I knew carried, I wasn't ready. carried on my normal affairs. Yeah, because it would be a huge responsibility if that had happened, something I wouldn't have been ready for, that's for sure. Then will the message of the third angel swell to a loud cry, right? So now there's probably a lot more there in six testimonies regarding this, but we we, we can see the idea here. Uh, what do these immovable Adventists now ha- have in their foreheads at that time? <clears throat> Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be seen, but is settling into the truth, both, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Indeed, as it has already begun, or begun already, the judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. So we can see that there is, and now this Ellen White's talking in her day, but we need to develop a character. We need to settle in the truth intellectually and spiritually. Our thoughts and our feelings have to be correct. These are our moral character. And when they're ready, this shaking will come, and not before that. As the message now swells to a loud cry, what will be the result? Standard after standard was left to trail in the dust, as company after company from the Lord's army joined the foe, and tribe after tribe from the ranks of the enemy united with the commandment keeping people of God. So a company is smaller than a tribe. So companies are going to leave from the Lord's army and tribe after tribe are gonna join their ranks. That's gonna be the result of the loud cry. The numbers of this company had lessened. Some had been shaken out and left by the way, the careless and indifferent who did not join with those who prized victory and salvation enough to perseveringly plead and agonize for it, did not obtain it. And they were left behind in darkness and their places were immediately immediately filled by others, taking hold of the truth and coming into the ranks. 
The Lord has faithful servants who, in the shaking, testing time, will be disclosed to view. There are precious ones, now hidden, who have not bowed the knee to Baal, but have not had the light which has been shining in a concentrated blaze upon you. But it may be under a rough and uninviting exterior. The pure brightness of a genuine Christian character will be revealed. In the daytime, we look toward heaven, but do not see the stars. They are there, fixed in the firmament, but the eye cannot distinguish them. In the night, we behold their genuine luster. I'm going to share a short experience I had a few days ago. When I go when I go out and about around town, <clears throat> I usually carry about five pounds of books with me, and mm-hmm. I come back empty every time. Yeah. And this one one time, there's two people standing, a man and a woman, and walking by. They asked me for something, and I said, "Yeah, here." And then uh, I said, "Oh, and would you like this little book on the Bible, Bible verses?" And they looked at each other. They looked at me. And, they said, I can't believe it. We were just talking about how dark and evil this city is and, and how how it is. And you're you're giving us this and, and uh thank you so much. Do you have one for each of us? And I didn't, but I said you can share it. Talked with them for a little while and I prayed with them. They're they're homeless, you know, they're they're homeless, but they were proper and respectful mm-hmm. and, and I prayed with them and I think there's going to be people like that that will come because the seeds have been planted and they're going to see it in in the living witnesses of the 144,000. They will join with us at that time, if not before. Yeah, I've always had a great sympathy with the people who are the outcast and the downtrodden, you know, probably somewhat, you know, from the way that I was raised. But, you know, growing up, I mean, I I was a protector of those, that class of people, you know, the younger kids who would get picked on, you know, and and I've never been a fan of, of the people who are at the top of the pile, so to speak, right? Because one is they often are mean, and, and the set of people who, who have been mistreated can be some of the kindest nicest people right it's just but but we have in our mind you know the successful people i mean obviously not us here hopefully but you know average person looks to somebody who's very successful as a good car a really good job as 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 more you know proper right and i mean we're all familiar with this idea but and even if we do give lip, lip service to it sometimes, you know, we might hear stories and cry little tears in church. In our practical life, we generally don't act that way, right? So, Right from a child, I remember elementary school, when I'm seeing people picked on, and I stepped in, you know, just couldn't couldn't stand by. I stepped in and defend the underdog. I've, right, right from being a kid, I've been with that. Yeah. I got in a lot of fights oh, fighting for other people, but I don't know if that was good or not. But anyway, uh, we just got this last statement here. It says, notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. And, um, you know, it's something that we can look forward to. So, I mean, obviously we can talk about the shaking and all the bad things that are going to happen. But, there's some very amazing things that are going to happen as we approach the time of Christ's second coming. And we need to have confidence and trust in these things that God has promised and, and not have a focus upon the things that we have no control over that are maybe discouraging. Any, any final quote? Thought? How does that quote go? That, uh, the world needs people who will stand for the truth so the world fall. Like that's what, that's what I'm looking for is when the majority are really against against light. The, yeah. Again, yeah. That's when that's when the light's really gonna shine in our lives. Yeah. It's, it's gonna be it's gonna the be contrast will be seen. Yeah. 
it'll be interesting to see too how things shake out in the end in time. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Let's uh, close with a word of prayer. A dear Father in heaven, thank you for each person. We pray that you can bless our Sabbath and these studies that we uh, participate in. We pray that you can bless each person. Um, you know, Kelly and Dana and Angela and Dwight and William and Rand and myself and all those people who watch uh, these videos. I pray, Lord, that um, that we can feel your presence, know that you are there, and that you can help us um, to focus our thoughts upon you. Forgive us for our sins and help us to trust fully in you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.